Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. My name is Lauren Richmond Jr. Today I'm welcoming Dan Stringer. Dan grew up as a third culture kid in five countries on three continents. He is a graduate of Wheaton College and Fuller Theological Seminary, ordained in the Evangel- Evangelical Covenant Church, and serves as team leader for universities, graduate, and faculty ministries in Hawaii. Dan is pastor of theological formation at Wellspring Covenant Church in Halawa, Hawaii. He previously was a social worker helping people obtain housing and employment. He has written for Missio Alliance, Inheritance, and Level Ground, and is a contributor to Father Factor. So let's welcome Dan to the show. All right, welcome to the show, Dan Stringer. Thanks for being here. What else would you like our listeners to know about you? Hey, Lauren. I'm so glad to be on this show. Thanks so much for having me. Um, The bio says most of what you might need to know as an author about me. I think for my day-to-day life, knowing that I'm a pastor's husband, I think is important too. I'm actually sitting in a church office. My wife is the the only full-time pastor of our church. And so um, that's just a big part of my my world. I'm a pastor too, more of kind of in a bivocational part-time setting. My full-time work is with InterVarsity. But um, if anyone wants to reach out and chat about um, supporting women in ministry or being a pastor's husband, happy to talk about that anytime. Yeah, I feel like I don't want to get off course already. <laughs> it's not in the bio, though. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you follow-up questions, but I don't want to get off course so quickly. Um, share a little bit about your faith journey, if you would. Yeah, so I identify as growing up evangelical, even though I have meandered through a variety of different uh, mainline Protestant denominations. In the book, I mentioned the nine denominations I've been a part of. And then when my mom read the book, she's like, Dan, you forgot one. We were part of this Anglican Canadian thing when you were in first grade. Mm. And I was like, what? I didn't know about that. So I guess I I made it to double digits, 10 different denominations. (laughs) But um, a church plant was kind of the original place where I grew up from age zero to seven. It was planted by a church in the United Church of Christ, which on the continent sounds really liberal and not like a church planting group. But in the 80s here in Hawaii, they were planting quite a few um, initiatives. And the church that um, my parents were part of was belonging to that network. And it was a house church model where we had several different houses every week that would gather, like in a living room like ours. And then once a month, we would get together with the various house, house churches combining. Um, so in that context, I learned about asking Jesus into my heart, which I did at age six, thanks to my mom. Thank you, mom. And, um, from there, it just became a journey of learning more and more what it means, not only to have Jesus in your heart, but to be a follower of Jesus and kind of, you know, growing up in the church, but not only in Hawaii where things started, which is where I am now, but all over the world. So five countries, three continents, maybe even more if you consider Hawaii not really part of any of those continents. But um, my parents' medical mission work led us to move around a lot during my childhood, first to Canada, then to Congo Zaire, then back to Hawaii, then to Louisville, Kentucky, then to Kathmandu, Nepal, and finally to Manila, Philippines, where I graduated from high school before going to college in Chicagoland at Wheaton College, where I learned that I belong to this category of Christians called evangelicals, which up until then I'd never thought of myself as. But that's kind of the first 20 years of my life. And then the the second 20 years has just been processing that and figuring out, you know, amidst all the geographic moving, where is my home theologically and church-wise and um, in terms of a faith stream? Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing that. 
it's interesting. I imagine we'll talk more about it here when we get into the book, how your diverse background has really informed um, your your conversation, if I can use that word, about evangelicals and, and Christian faith, broader speaking, overall. Uh, share, if you would, a little maybe a spiritual practice or faith practice that's been meaningful for you. Sure. Well, one of the most meaningful ones is on my mind because I just met with my spiritual director yesterday and we meet once a month. And um, I've had a number of different spiritual directors over the years, but my current spiritual director is a Catholic woman who is just fantastic at helping me not only look for God's work in my life, but look for God inside. Um, You know, in evangelical world, we tend to look for God on the outside of ourselves because we think of, you know, God is holy, we're not. And yet we also have this belief that the Spirit lives in us. And if the Spirit is God, then God is in us. And so there is a God in us to look for. And she helps me do that. And so I would encourage anyone who has not looked into spiritual direction, there's so many different ways to go about it, but that's been a practice that really helps me um, every month. I kind of liken it to going to the dentist where if you know your appointment's coming up, you tend to floss a little bit more, keep an eye on how how your oral health is doing. I think it's the same way with me and my spiritual director. I'm like, oh gosh, have I been in touch with the God in me? Have I been, you know, not just thinking about ministry metrics of effectiveness and whether people like me or not, or whether I'm being effective or not, but how am I actually in my connection um, with God outside and inside me? That's really good. That's a really good point you bring up. Not Maybe not the brushing, flossing thing, but I think the temptation to evaluate our spirituality based on external metrics of, you know, ministry effectiveness, all that stuff. Um, it's really, I really want to highlight that. Well, so Dan is the author of, has it been, I think it's been released, right, as we're recording this, Struggling with Evangelicalism, Why I Want to Leave and What It Takes to Stay. And I was fortunate to get a copy of this from University Press, and I really found it quite meaningful in um, honest, authentic conversation. And fortunately, Dana was willing to come on and talk about it. So I just I want to hear first, and maybe for our listeners, kind of what inspired the book and, and uh, how it came about. Well, as you might expect, it comes from a very personal journey of my own struggle with evangelicalism, which initially had to do with the label. What does it mean? Can I use it to apply my, you know, is it something I want to use to describe myself or not? And how come even when I don't want to use it, it still seems to describe me in certain ways, even if depending on how the word is used, it doesn't because this word, it just has so many meanings and it's not just one thing to be evangelical. So that journey has been taking place for most of my adulthood, like I said earlier, since college days at Wheaton, where I became aware of this particular expression of Christianity that's more than just Protestant um, Christianity, but a particular type within that, um, but not necessarily as narrow as, say, a denomination. So just kind of growing in that awareness, grappling with what that means, particularly in political election years when the word definitely gets used a lot more um, in campaign coverage. And that's when we tend to, you know, want to do away with it and never say it again. And then for some reason, every election year, we keep saying it. And then we find other um, reasons that we can't stop talking about it because there isn't really another word that identifies our particular type of Christianity, quite like the evangelical word does. So that, that whole journey was a big part of it. And then once I started to think of it more um, as a space, evangelicalism being a spiritual habitat, a type of Christianity, a particular place where our faith is lived out, then that's something that's a lot harder and more challenging to just drop than, say, a label or a brand. Um, and I started to be more concerned about that because I think that's actually the space where more of an impact is made for good or bad. It's where a lot of damage can be done. Um, 
not that a label or a brand can't do damage as well. You know, people know when it's impacting our reputation or our ability to be understood, our credibility. Yes, that hurts, but it doesn't hurt on the level of, you know, someone having real traumatic experiences with Christianity itself and how it's, you know, been part of certain patterns that we see over and over again, harming people. Um, And so that was really what I wanted to write more about is struggling with that space where you know you're part of it and you know there's something wrong and yet there's enough that's still keeping you there for whatever reason that it's not an easy choice to leave or stay. So because of that ambivalence, the book is really written for people who have some sort of mixed feelings, some sort of um, should I stay or should I go type of question happening. If it's a more of a slam dunk, you, you really want to stay, you really want to go, then um, it's not really designed for that type of audience who's already made up their mind. But if you're, if you're not sure, then that's who the book is for. Explain more about the brand versus space. Cause I thought that was an interesting, that was a really interesting thing you did early in the book. Yeah. So that shift was really helpful for me in my own process of struggling with what it means to be or not to be an evangelical. I think the short answer is that a brand is very narrow. It's something that you buy. It's something that you can either wear or not wear if you think about the consumer market, right? So there's this evangelical brand that's out there. Um, People have in their minds of what an evangelical is, how an evangelical votes, how they look, how they believe. And when that's, you know, not describing many of us, we say, no way, that's, that's not something that I want to identify with. So we drop the brand. Makes a lot of sense because we don't want to identify ourselves that way when it makes it, you know, confusing, hard to be understood. Credibility goes down. There's just a lot of good reasons to not use that word to describe yourself. But then once you think about it as more than a brand and how that word evangelical has much more to it when you think about it as describing an entity known as evangelicalism, the noun, and that is a particular type of Christianity that creates a space where we live, if it's our spiritual home, if it's the type of kind of baseline of our faith practice, the type of church we go to, the type of books we read, the type of you know teaching that has formed us, or maybe if we've gone to a Christian school or worked for a Christian organization, often that means an evangelical school or an evangelical organization, or we've been part of an evangelical church church plant, denomination, parachurch ministry. So if that's the kind of air that we breathe in this spiritual habitat of evangelicalism as a space, then that starts to become much more diverse and broad and complex than the brand, which is really narrow, similar to the brand of the USA, right? It's a narrow red, white, and blue, stars and stripes, Uncle Sam. And not everyone who lives, you know, in the 50 states or territories wants to identify with that American image that people have. But then it's also true that they may still live here um, and this still may be their home. And I think for a lot of evangelicals who don't identify with the brand, they still inhabit the space. Um, and so because of that, it's it's where our spiritual home is, at least for now. Yeah, I think that's helpful. Kind of getting further into that, I thought this connects with something that I thought you did really well, or at least I really appreciated of your emphasis on recognizing evangelicalism as more than just white American evangelicalism. And I know you, you know, you mentioned the political season or the presidential election season more specifically where, you know, the white evangelical vote is just huge, at least I don't know how huge it is actually, but it gets played up a lot in the national media. And that becomes, I think you point this out in the book, equated with evangelicalism as a whole. And I think one of the great things you did in the book was separating. So it's, it's not, they're not amalgamous. Yes. When it's used as a, as a political voting block terminology, it was fascinating to me to discover as I researched more that, you know, evangelicalism is not separated from whiteness hardly ever when it comes to these polls. So if you fill out one of these 
surveys or respond after voting, you'll have certain choices given to you and it'll be, you know, white mainline Protestant or white evangelical Protestant. So either way, it's white. It's just a matter of what type of Protestant you are. But then once you move out of being white, then they use totally different names like black Protestant or Catholic or what, you know, the word evangelical isn't used for these non-white Christians sometimes. So of course we have a more white understanding when the only evangelicals being described or discussed are those who are white. Not that that isn't important and isn't something to be aware of. Um, And we can't just say, oh yeah, we're so much, you know, better. And, you know, we're not like what the media says we are. Well, we kind of are, but there's more to us than that. And that's just describing a, a slice when you look at certain ways that the term is used. Um, Christianity Today did a report not too long ago that showed about a third in the U.S. of folks who could be described as evangelical are people of color. And that number goes up as you get younger. So I think if it's people who are below age 30, um, the percentage is even higher than than one third. So it gets a lot more diverse um, than the brand once you start looking at who are the folks who actually have evangelical beliefs and inhabit evangelical spaces. They're not represented. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so I warned you I was going to ask you this question. I think this this fits into a question I was going to ask you. Uh, as we're recording this, this the SCOTUS uh, Supreme Court is debating the, the Mississippi challenge to the Roe v. Wade issue. And without getting – I don't need you to get into, if you don't want to, kind of your personal opinions on how that should should or shouldn't be. But I, I, I was thinking about it this week, especially in light of this book. And much of what you discussed in the book is kind of reasons people leave evangelicalism, kind of their disillusionment and dissatisfaction with this kind of – at least what I perceive as this kind of uh, just unending pursuit of power in the name of power. Um, like, what do you think? What's your, what's your take? Like, do you think it's been worth it? I guess is what I'm saying. Like, do you think if Roe v. Wade gets overturned, will it have been worth it? Or do you think the cost, like, like the, the old analogy, like you, you got what you wanted, but you lost what you had. Yeah. I think the short answer is that it's, not worth it. I think that in my own journey, a big part of kind of sorting through some of these political questions in public life, which are very important and we shouldn't ignore. um, I think I started learning about Sojourner's Magazine when I was around 25. Um, This was around the, the time of the Bush administration. And he would go Uh, Jim Wallace, the editor, would go on The Daily Show and say things like, why are we thinking that there are only two Christian issues in politics, abortion and gay marriage? And that really resonated with me because I started to notice, yeah, we're just talking about a real narrow, short list of things when there are so many other moral issues that have, frankly... um, more time spent in scripture on them, whether it's poverty, whether it's violence, whether it's just, you know, systemic injustice, idolatry. Um, And it's not that people have to come to the same conclusions on those things. I think that it's a mistake to think, you know, if you're a true believer in Jesus or you really understand the Bible, then, you know, there's just going to be like one set platform that everyone's going to you know arrive at and we just all need to get there it's like no it really just depends what your priorities are what your background is what you're called to i think it's totally possible for people to have a strong sense of calling um in ways that might you know conflict with other christians see that all the time because our context really shapes who we are um and so just kind of seeing that there's so much more to being pro-life. There's so much more to being um, concerned about policy from a Christian perspective. I think that was a real eye-opening part of the journey for me was just kind of expanding the awareness of what other issues and how come certain issues get so much 
disproportionate amount of airtime compared to other things and starting to realize hmm, this isn't just a matter of Christian versus non-Christian or people who are serious about the Bible or not. There's some really you know deeper disagreements here within people, w- within the church of you know folks who take Jesus very seriously. There's tremendous disagreement there. Yeah. I was thinking back this week. Um, I, you, you mentioned the Bush administration. I remember I was a freshman, I think it was to age myself. I was a freshman in Bible college when the – uh, when George W. was running part of that part of that election, or at least early in his in his um, in his presidency, struggling for words there, and mm-hmm. I remember just even at church the conversation being, "Oh, this is great. We're going to be able to be able to elect judges." Uh, and the point of this I say is that you know I'm a person who often finds myself inhabiting spaces more on the left, and I see similar trends happening of of you know if we can just get this law passed and that law passed and i'm sure we would both agree there are unjust laws uh that need to be changed but i don't i wonder if this is something we can both agree on that i believe even as someone who would identify more to the left theologically like i believe in that the power of the gospel needs to transform lives and i I guess that's what I fear is I've seen what, at least from my perspective, what kind of damage this pursuit of power can do to uh, branches of Christianity. And I fear the same thing that could happen to those that identify in the left progressive sphere of Christianity. If it just like, if we, if we see like the, the end goal of our mission and ministry is being changing laws rather than changing hearts through the power of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's certainly some complexity and depth there because the other side of the coin is that I'm concerned about Christians who are apolitical and try to completely separate faith from politics. Um, You know, I think another, another maxim that I learned in those early days of reading Sojourners was that um, faith is personal, but never private or that budgets are moral documents. Um, and I think our faith does have to matter in public life. And I think when people, um, you know, take political action on the basis of their belief, my issue is not so much that they're taking action. The issue is often more in what way are they going about it? What type of witness are they rendering and and the other big part of it is like what are they pursuing like are they pursuing like the preservation of a bygone era where their particular you know slice of america had more say over things because i think that sometimes when we look at what's happening sociologically on the surface it might look like okay these people really just you know care about their faith and freedom of religion and expressing their faith. And that's could be true. Um, But they're not the only ones doing this. So how come so many different groups who are putting faith in action don't agree? How come so many different groups who claim to love Jesus and scripture come to vastly different conclusions, even on things like abortion? Um, And so to me, we have to look at not so much saying, okay, don't try to change things or get involved in politics as much as saying, when you do, um, be sure to have some accountability and awareness of why you're doing it, how you're doing it, and what message it sends. Um, But it's a really tough thing because on one hand, you have folks who say, let's stop talking about race and taxes and laws and Washington, D.C., let's just talk about Jesus. And there's a problem there, right, when it's just, okay, Jesus becomes restricted to the individual private life. Yeah. I think you're saying what I hope to say, but better than I'd said it, so thank you. <laughs> I think we agree. <laughs> I'm reminded, speaking of uh, Catholic spiritual directors, 
Um, unfortunately, I haven't seen her in a few months, but my spiritual director uh, reminded me of the danger of when the ends justify the means, because she said, when the ends justify the means, the means become the ends. And mm -hmm. I think this is my opinion. You don't have to agree, but I think we've seen that in many brand, many segments of right leaning politics where the, the, yes. the means has become the ends have become power and the means to power has become all these different tools. And then that's become the means have become the end where it's, it's, it's owning the libs. It's whatever. And mm -hmm. I just, I so fear that happening on the other side, because I see how it's destructive, how destructive and dangerous it is. And I, I just want to scream to whoever will listen. Like it matters. The ends can never justify the means, at least in my opinion, because of how destructive and dangerous it can be. Yeah, I think they both matter, right? The ends matter, the means matter, the narratives that feed into those approaches matter. Like if we have this narrative that says we are in like, you know, an all out spiritual cultural battle between good and evil, and we're the good ones who want XYZ policies in place, or we want, you know, prayer in schools and the Ten Commandments and the Supreme Court, like if that's good and then everything else is evil, um, then that's a, that's a narrative that can do a lot of damage. And I think we're seeing the consequences of that. And we've seen the consequences of that for a while where, you know, rather than pursuing what Jesus seemed to pursue in his life, reaching to the margins, lifting up the poor, preaching good news to the poor, freedom for the oppressed, not having you know, a categorization or compartmentalization between social and spiritual. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we see so many things that clash with that Jesus in terms of the way American evangelicals do politics. So I might be, you know, not in agreement with some, some of my friends who would say, just, you know, stay away from the whole power thing, stay away from Washington, D.C., and, you know, don't get involved in these political stuff because you'll just get your faith compromised. I, I can understand that at the same time. Um, I also know that we do have good examples of folks like Martin Luther King Jr. and other Christians who were very involved in, you know, having a holistic understanding of social and spiritual change. And we have evangelicals um, who care about those things, too. Yeah. Well, these are the kind of good conversations that I appreciate about the book that you're willing to engage these kind of challenging conversations. Um, let me get back into the book a little bit more here. I I'm reminded of the section of the book. You talk about um, evangelicals emphasis on personal uh, transformation or repentance. And this is one of the critiques I've had personally of, evangelicalism is that it doesn't really have a collective sense of the need for repentance. And you point that out in the book, which I thought was awesome. And then you had probably the best take I've read on Jesus' baptism like ever. So you talk about how Jesus' baptism, again, in, in traditional Christian theology, Jesus is a sinless, perfect human being. So why does he need the baptism of, of John's baptism? And you point out your take on it is that, if I'm remembering correctly, um, Jesus was partaking because it was a communal repentance and he was a part of the community. I thought that was so incredible right. and so profound. Especially especially because I think that was a part of your chapter on the whole, the whole like, uh, what is it, like not all white Christians type thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that, that was so powerful for me to read. Yeah, thanks. Um Hopefully, I have properly cited my seminary professor, Tommy Givens. I quote him in that section because um, he he's a New Testament professor at Fuller who has shaped my thinking on the baptism of Jesus and how, you know, despite our individualistic understandings of, you know, focusing on Jesus as personally pure and personally sinless, you know, was he just showing us an example, like just, you know, be baptized like me, 
or was he actually part of something on a much more community level of the sins of his people and not yeah. and not seeing the sins of his people as anything other than his own in terms of the community from which he came and belongs and cares about and so for us as evangelicals you know it's not enough to say did i do something racist or you know greedy today Probably, but that's not even the main question as much as who are we as a people if these are our patterns and practices and what types of decisions, actions are we doing communally that need to be repented of, much like the people of God throughout scripture, right? They lament corporately, they confess corporately, and the prophets call them to change their ways corporately, to turn, to repent, to live differently in light of who God calls them to be. And so, you know, the book doesn't necessarily try to give a comprehensive list of what to repent of as much as how to go about it when those things are identified. Because just as there are all kinds of individual sins and things that trip us up and get in the way of God's best for us, the same is true on the collective level. The same is true on you know, a church level or a denominational level or the level of evangelicalism as a, as a broader movement. Yeah. I still love, I still am just pondering the beauty of that theological image because I think it's so relevant right now, especially um, in white America uh, and as a white American it's, it's, during the last year plus of, um, you know, the, 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 the issues about around race and injustice in America. So many uh, white people have pushed back individually. We say, hey, I'm not a racist. You know, I don't, whatever, um, because we have the individual focus. And I think that's such a, that image or that metaphor or whatever of Jesus' baptism as collectively repenting for the sins of his people. I think it's such a beautiful, beautiful image uh, for the church to lean into. Uh, I love that. So thank you, Professor, uh, for that for that image. Um, let me switch gears here just a little bit here, because I wanted to ask about exvangelical. The, the, the you know the exvangelical hashtag it, it probably started as right. Again, this is one I think the things that I thought was really great about the book. Again, you weren't afraid to address those hard issues, and you issued them directly. I think, I think there's a fair word apologetically, or at least humbly. Uh, so you want to talk more about kind of the approach, um, kind of you wrote a letter in the book to ex-evangelicals and, and you kind of said, it's okay to leave and talk more about that. Yeah, there's a, a real short section in the book that's kind of an open letter to ex-evangelicals um, who may or may not be reading or listening. Um, you know, the book isn't primarily written to folks who have already been, you know, so burned or maybe even kicked out. I think it really matters how you leave because on one hand, I've had some interactions with folks on social media who are reminding me, you know, not everyone who leaves evangelicalism is like, you know, super devastated about it or you know, was forced out, maybe they left for their own, you know, rational and positive reasons, which is totally possible. And I think that's a different situation than someone who actually wanted to stay and was not able to, they had to be, they left involuntarily. Um, Those are the ones that really, I find heartbreaking, because you have people for whom an evangelical church or an evangelical space Is there, you know, the only spiritual home they've known? It's the only type of Christianity they've known. It's the only Christian friends they've known. And they want to be part of it. But for whatever reason, they just, they just don't conform enough. They're too different. And they, you know, have some kind of thing about them or some belief or some practice um, that is deemed too far outside of the circle. And so they're pushed out. Um, for those types of ex-evangelicals, I think it's really important for those of us who are still on the inside to 
listen to their stories and learn, you know, to the degree that they're willing to share. Um, you don't, we don't want to put the onus on them to like fix problems that the rest of us have caused. On the other hand, we can't just be talking amongst ourselves, those of us who are still part of evangelicalism without realizing there's a whole chorus of people who are no longer with us, who have a lot of wisdom to say about, you know, how things could be healthier, how things could be less toxic. What are some of, you know, not just the individual personality conflicts or particular um, unique situations, but what are the patterns? What are the things that we keep hearing about over and over and over, whether it's related to sexuality or whether it's related to, you know, something political or some sort of, you know, behavior related control issue that the church just, you know, really wants to maintain purity culture or something that just um, is way too controlling of people. And then that just has, has caused a lot of damage. So there's a fine line there between on one hand, you know, addressing ex evangelicals and knowing that their voices and concerns matter while also recognizing that they're probably not the primary audience of who I'm writing to. I'm not trying to say, Hey, come on back. We're going to make it better for you. You know, tell us, tell us how we can, um, keep you here. Like for a lot of folks, you know, they've, they've moved on, um, and the ship has sailed. So it's more about preventing future damage. That's kind of what I'm, I'm concerned about more. Yeah. But the, I, I just want to give you credit. Cause I think one of the things, I think the key things that I think about of a good, honest leader is being honest and authentic about what the real struggles are. And I think anybody who tries to lead in evangelical spaces without acknowledging what has happened is just disingenuous and dishonest. So I think uh, for that purpose alone, you can help folks who are on the fence right now just by saying, hey, this is a real issue. People struggle with, I'm going to be real and open and honest about it. Um, I like to be helpful in this podcast. So before we take a break, you have some practical suggestions and glimpses of hope. Give us maybe a couple, three of those. Yeah, I think the first one I would say is just to do what we can to name our particular expression of Christianity. doesn't mean that we always have to lead with, Hey, I'm an evangelical Christian. Who are you? But at least internally, the more we can be precise when it's helpful to recognize, you know, if we're just talking about evangelicalism, we should try to, to, to name the fact that we're talking about just evangelicalism. So if we're saying, you know, I went to a Christian college called Wheaton. Well, yeah, but it's a particular, it's an evangelical college. Um, we're not talking about Notre Dame or other um, Christian colleges, other Christian colleges. Right. So in that case, if it's something that doesn't apply to all Christians, um, you know, I, I would say try to identify the particular tradition that it's from so that we're building that awareness that we don't have a monopoly on Jesus and we're not communicating to people, oh, the way that the Christian view on this, if we're just talking about our denomination's view, or if we say, oh, you know, here, here's, here's, the, here's the Christian way to um, pray when we're really just talking about our particular churches or even maybe an evangelical style of prayer. Um, because otherwise that communicates that, you know, if you don't do it exactly this way, then you're not a follower of Jesus. Or if you go to a different church or have a different set of favorite authors or styles of worship, that you're not a Christian. And that can do tremendous harm because then when it comes time for people to decide Gosh, I think I'm done here. I guess I'm I guess I'm done with the whole Jesus thing because they said they have the whole Jesus thing, you know, down. So the more we can distinguish between, you know, the breadth of Christianity and how many different ways there are to follow Jesus and then our particular stream, I think that can be that can be helpful. In terms of glimpses of hope, to answer your question, I would say that um there are glimpses of hope all around, especially once we look outside the brand. Um, I am somebody who really finds hope in seeing these folks come into kind of a non-colonized or decolonized version of faith from the beginning. So they don't have to have 
all of this deconstruction happen because what's being constructed from the beginning is very diverse. And um, here in Hawaii, we have a wonderful movement of Native Hawaiian followers of Jesus who use, you know, Hawaiian scriptures to the de- degree that they can. And when they're using English, when they're using American terminology, it's named as such. So it's not like assuming that the American way is the Jesus way. Um, often the American way clashes with the Jesus way. Um, and so it's really important to kind of understand folks from perspectives for whom they're coming in like the front door with a much better, I think, approach to discipleship that's holistic, that cares about the land, that cares about, you know, intergenerational relationships, isn't just focused on like, you know, extracting words from a page. Like I've learned so much about how Western I am and how cognitive and um, this particular I am in my, in my approach. And when I'm with my, my native um, Hawaiian and indigenous sisters and brothers, I just learned so much more about um, how, how to do things in a, in a better way. So they give me a lot of hope. Well, I appreciate that. I feel like we haven't even, uh, I feel like we should have, I should have at least said something about, I mean, Hawaii is a, a story in itself about Christian colonialism, right? That we don't have time for it, but could be a whole nother podcast, but I feel like at least should be acknowledged right there itself. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, wherever you live, you know, it doesn't have to be Hawaii. It can just be wherever you're, wherever you live and, you know, do your best to understand the history of the church there. And it might be more complex than just the Christians took over. And then, you know, all the, all the victims were non-Christians. It could very, very well be that there are followers of Jesus, um, among those who are not typically considered quote unquote Christian because they're not, they're not Western English speaking when in reality they have a lot more (laughs) to teach us about, about Jesus. Yeah. Well, again, the book is struggling with evangelicalism. Why I want to leave what it takes to stay. Dan is not afraid to, to tackle those complex, complicated conversations. So uh, Dan, let's take a break and we'll come back with some closing questions. All right, we're back with Dan Stringer. Uh, he's technically Reverend Dan Stringer, so Dan, I want to give you that credit there. <laughs> Thanks. So the first question I'm going to ask you, I always take, tell folks you can take these as seriously or not as you want to, is what you would do if you're Pope for a day. This whole episode, I've been looking off camera at your wife's, I'm assuming her beautiful stole and robe. Yes. So our, our listeners can't see that. Um so I'm guessing uh, she serves in a tradition. I'm looking it up on the web here. What uh, see Covenant Church where they have that liturgical tradition of the stole and the robe. Um, so it kind of feels a little bit liturgical here with asking a Pope question. So uh, what would you do Pope <laughs> for a day? Well, the short answer is that I would do my best to put in policies that support women in leadership at all levels of ministry. Um, I think the Pope can do that. I don't know how that works, but wouldn't it be awesome if we had women priests and clergy across all, all denominations um, and they wouldn't have to like form these, you know, enclaves on the margins, but like, you know, we'd have female bishops and Catholic priests and stuff. Yeah. Um, I just thought of that as you were mentioning my wife. She actually doesn't get to wear the stole too often, but she did get ordained this past year. So that was part of the process to be given a stole um, when you're ordained. We're not very liturgical here um, at our particular covenant church, although there's a lot of freedom and flexibility depending on your context. I know there are some churches in our our denomination that have more uh, robes and smells and bells and things like that. But as you know, when you sent me this question about being Pope for a day, I was like, wow, that's a, I don't know what I would do. Hopefully there would be some time. Like hopefully I'd, I'd at least have like a month or two's notice so I could gather data and talk to people about what to do. <laughs> I would try to, I would try to get as many perspectives on, you know, whether we would focus on like, you know, redistributing things financially or making a policy thing, or maybe just having 
something more more positive and uplifting. I think the structure of my book, based on these four postures of awareness, appreciation, repentance, and renewal, that would kind of be my yeah baseline of saying, okay, in the twenty four hours of my papacy, we're gonna do six hours of appreciation, six hours of repentance, renewal, uh, awareness. And then we'll and then we'll sleep once it's over, I guess. Because if you've only got twenty four hours, you can maybe do do the best you could. But I have no idea what what to do. Very <laughs> ambitious. I don't know if I've had someone bring that <laughs> level of planning to it. So I appreciate the big responsibility. Yeah, honestly, I think the current pope would probably um, have a really good answer to this because I really like his his approach. But I can't imagine trying to lead that level of diversity or. Um, just the size of people. (laughs) I'll let you know if I can get the Pope on. Uh, (laughs) Um, It's a great question. Made me think a lot. A theologian or historical Christian figure you would want to meet or bring back to life. Well, I already mentioned Martin Luther King. Um, He was born the same year as my grandmother who just, you know, passed away a few years ago. So just to imagine, like, instead of at age 39, what if he had lived to be 89? Yeah. Um, so much wisdom and depth there. Someone who listeners may not be as familiar with would be our Queen Uliokulani here in Hawaii, who was a person of deep faith and was not only well-known for being the last reigning monarch of Hawaii as an independent kingdom, until the 1890s, but she was a tremendous um, songwriter, hymn writer, uh, spiritual leader, disciple of Jesus. And so particularly here locally in the islands, I would love to, you know, just have her around to see her perspective on all that's transpired in the hundred plus years. Um, since the U.S. took over, I would love to to hear because you wouldn't get just an anti-Christian perspective. You would get kind of a decolonized um, perspective of critiquing the empire, I'm assuming, but from a very deep place of faith and discipleship. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, What do you think history will remember from our current time and place? Wow. Well, whoever wins this culture war thing will probably get to say a lot because who you know the the victors kind of get to write the stories. Um, hopefully, there will be some complexity in our telling of what has taken place. On one hand, there's so much division and polarization um, within the church. On the other hand, you know some of that is healthy to a certain degree because it highlights issues that need to be highlighted and we don't want to just have kind of the the sheen of unity when it doesn't really af- reflect reality um, that we do have tremendous disagreements about what Jesus and scripture are teaching us um, so I, I really don't know if it'll be the the conflation of, of God and country and this whole like evangelical political alignment, or if it'll be something um, different, who knows? Yeah. Uh, what do you hope for positively? What do you hope for the future of Christianity? I think that my hope is that the resources that we have, um, both in terms of technology as well as information, relationships, opportunities to find like-minded people around the world through, um, you know, video calls and groups and books. Hopefully that'll lead us to a greater awareness of how we have been shaped in our own formation. Um, Even if it was in a non-denominational setting, even if it seems like it was dropped straight from the sky, I hope that with all this um, opportunities to dig into things like Ancestry.com, hopefully we can do that on a spiritual level. Hopefully we can do that on a collective ecclesial church level where we can see, 
where do we come from and what do we have in common and what makes us different so that we can appreciate the uniqueness of what our faith stream brings as well as critique. Um, you know, without necessarily having to say like all of Christianity has this rotten feature, like it might just be a particular, you know, network or denomination or stream. Um, and so the more we can appreciate, I think that diversity and awareness, the more we can lean into, um, a better future, just like it's, it's really valuable to have self-awareness, right. On a personal level, to know your own strengths and weaknesses, you can, you can live into your strengths and not keep, you know, banging against a wall, wondering like, how come I'm not good at this? Oh man. And then you, you know, spend so much time trying to like fix things when you could just live into your strengths and, and acknowledge what you're weak at and say, huh, someone else has those strengths. Why don't we rely on them? You know, there's not going to be a perfect denomination or church tradition. We have to rely on each other, which starts with admitting we have some problems here. We also have some strengths, but when it comes to our shortcomings, we can lean on other um, traditions and and followers of Christ who have different um, strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Well, this has been a great conversation. Really appreciate your time. Where can people connect with you and uh, find your book? Sure. Well, I'm on Twitter at Rev Dan Stringer. Um, I'm not as active on other social media platforms, but it is Rev Dan Stringer on Instagram, Facebook, as well as Twitter. Um, if you want to learn more about the book, you can go to my website, danstringer.net. But the book is available pretty much wherever you get your books. But there's links on my website, danstringer.net, where you can find um, places to read reviews, find out more about what I've written, as well as um, go get the book. Great. Well, thanks again It's for your time. The book is Struggling with Evangelicalism, Why I Want to Leave, and What It Takes to Stay. Appreciate it. I uh, always leave folks with a word of peace, so may God's peace be with you. Awesome. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future-christian.com. One more thing before you go, do us a favor and subscribe to the podcast. And if you're feeling especially generous, leave a review. It really helps us get the word out to more people about the podcast. The Future Christian Podcast is a production of Torn Curtain Arts and Resonate Media. Our episodes were mixed by Danny Burton, and the production support is provided by Paul Romaglevitt. Thanks, and go in peace. Peace.